glad that you're here today. And very glad that we have Mr. Phil Bourne, affectionately known as Grub, which it. I think he's going to address that today, uh, here to be part of our Manchester Memories series. Um, Cindy Waters, who's our adult programming coordinator, developed this program and it is designed for locals to share local stories of yesteryear. And we have Grub here today, Sean Harrington of the Manchester Historical Society will be here on April 17th at 1 p.m. So please join us for that. Um, and I just wanted, as an introduction to Grub, I thought that it would be fun to read to many of you who probably um, were not able to hear about the House of Representatives um, resolution that was passed in honor of Grubb. Really? So I'm going to read that to you. So this was a House resolution that was passed, whereas a municipal fire chief must react quickly and wisely in the midst of tension-filled emergency situations and also oversee the department's daily administrative <coughs> matters. And whereas Manchester Fire Chief Phil Grubb Bourne has served in this pivotal role <coughs> twice, initially for a five-year term from 1994 to 1999, and then for a longer period, commencing in 2003 and continuing for 15 years into 2018. Whereas the responsibilities of the Manchester Fire Chief entail devoting approximately 20 hours each week I bet it was more than that, to overseeing the personnel and financial details of the department's operations. Whereas Grubb Bourne has performed both the routine and extraordinary supervisory duties of his post while owning Boar's Tire and Auto Center and personally managing in, in excess of 100 plowing accounts for his customers in the winter. Whereas mm -hmm. his fellow firefighters have great confidence in Grubb Bourne's leadership having repeatedly re-elected him as his chief, as their chief. And it goes on about infrastructure, radio systems, all the things that he did. Um, whereas in directing the firefighting and protection services in Manchester, Grubb Bourne continued a family tradition as his father was chief until 1970. And whereas after a combined 20 years in command as the outstanding Manchester fire chief, Grubb Bourne is handing over his portfolio of duties to another chief. And although his successful tenure as chief is ending, Grubb Bourne is not departing and intends to remain an active member of the Manchester Fire Department, responding to the calls to douse a blaze and to continue his teaching role as a Vermont State Fire Instructor. So this was this resolution. And you can imagine that a gentleman as esteemed as Grubb Bourne has lots of stories. So please. That was one I didn't even know about. Really? No. Yeah, well, there you go. There you go. We're very proud and pleased that Grubb is here today. We have some friends in the audience, some longtime friends that may um, add their voices to today. But I hope feel, not too much. Feel free <laughs> to ask questions and learn a little bit more about Manchester through the eyes of Grub Bourne. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I guess one of the first questions that everybody wants to know is how I got the nickname Grub. So we, I grew up in the center of town uh, next to where BM Toomey Motors used to be is where's Langway Chevrolet on the corner right there. And we, my mom had a beauty shop and Don Powers started his body shop, Powers Body Shop, in the cellar and painted cars in between the boilers. I don't know why the place never blew up. And mom had her beauty shop upstairs and dad had his garage out behind there. And we lived upstairs and above the beauty shop and cold storage and then there was another storage a huge building and my mom gave me Oshkosh coveralls and sewed the SO emblem on my shirt my coonskin hat and I donned through the shop constantly getting filthy dirty as Judy can attest <laughs> I think she got some of my grubby little hands on one of her white skirts one day so one day I was in the shop and uh, the guys were picking on me and 
I fell into it back then. They used to have a you used to have a bucket on the floor to wash your parts off with gasoline in them. Well, I fell in that. And of course, I was covered with gasoline, and I was, I think, three years old. Oh my God. And so they picked me up, and of course, they bring me in, and Pete Graves and my Uncle Norny, and Pete Graves looks at me and he says, You've got to be the grubbiest kid in the whole world. <laughs> and then they came up with the five G's and a T. <laughs> Grub's Garage, Greasiest Garage in town. Yeah, and that name, Grub, stuck, has stuck with me since I was three years old. Oh, and that's how I got it. Judy, I think you know that story. I do know that story. Yes. <laughs> so that was, that was one story. There was a lot of stories. Um, I can remember just looking out the window when old Pompietti would plow the, the streets with a D6 cableized with a cable bulldozer looking out the window, and one night, I believe Judy will remember this also, I think it was in 1962, when the Garrow store caught on fire. And I remember that, and I was probably maybe five, and I remember the phone ringing, and back then the telephone office was across from Garrow's, and I think her name was Mabel Mark. Thompson, I think, was the operator, yeah. and she would call all of the firemen. she just push all the wires into the switchboard and pick up the phone and say, you got a fire at Garrow's. And I remember Dad getting a phone call that night and him getting up and putting his rubber boots on and his brand new white jacket that they had just given him and his helmet, and out the door he went. And I sat there, and you could see the flames coming from the windows where we lived. And I have a picture of it, and I forgot it, but that picture is, it was the one that um, they took a picture of with, there was Joe Harrington and Joe Markey, and I think Fuzzy Knight, and I can't remember the rest of them that were standing on the ladders in front of the, putting the fire out from the Garrow's fire. That was one instance. Nick, for those who don't know, where was Garrow's is, you know where Maple, Maplefields is? In the center of town down here? Maplefields. Is it called Cilantro's now? Yeah. No. Yes. No. What? Yes, Cilantro's and Maplefields. Yes. And that was, it was a big old, you know, what, three, four story building. And I can remember my dad saying that it started an old piece of BX cable. And of course, Judy LaMountain's father was on the fire department bill at that time also. And Jimmy Comer's dad was on the fire department also. And I'm looking around the room, and I guess that's about it. But there's not many of them left that were still on to fight that fire. And then there was the big fire was the Equinox Hotel, which I was down in, I don't know if a lot of you know Lawrence Grant, but we were down, and it was a brutally, brutally cold day. And it was about 10 degrees, and we were trying to get his grader started, and it was down in Sunderland. And uh, we finally, after probably two hours, we finally got it started. And I ran back to the truck, and the tone went off and said the Equinox Hotel was fully involved. And I ran back over, and there was emergency shutoff on the grader, and I just reached over and swatted it. And I thought Lawrence was going to reach over and swat me because I, we had just spent two hours getting this grader running. And I says, Lawrence, we got to go. And we turned around and looked up. And the smoke you could see from Sunderland was belling up. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. And we crazily went up and, and started. And, you know, all the trucks showed up. And we had no water to fight it. And uh, we laid hose all the way from the Batten Kill all the way up to supply our first engine in and then a hose from the back. We finally had, and I think we had close to 2,000 feet of hose laid from the Batten Kill to the Equinox Hotel. And then Arlington came and laid close to 1,800 feet from the Delwood Cemetery to supply the south side of the building. And then there was a hydrant out behind there which supplied engine two and engine five. And we were there and that was 10 o'clock in the morning, and we were there until 5 the next morning. And it was, it was quite a fire. It was uh, 
the, the fourth floor came to the third, we were going to try to go in and knock it down. And luckily, Tommy Allett and I were a little late because before we went in, the floor had collapsed. And we decided, and that was when Lawrence pulled everybody out. And it became, and we had Bennington's tower come up. And we were there until uh, five, five o'clock in the morning. And that was in the 40 years, 38 years I've been on the fire department, that was probably the biggest fire that I'd ever seen. What, what year was that grub in? Was 1985, I believe, 85 or 87. Was it occupied then or not? It was going under, it was under construction. And uh, yeah. they had the first two floors were totally done. And the second two floors were just covered with plastic. And they were, had it stripped right down to bare, well, it's, bare walls, so you got 100-year-old wood in there. And they were moving a propane tank on the south side of the building. And of course, it was construction road, so it was rough. And they did not drain the tank. And that's how they're heating the building with these huge 1,000-gallon tanks on trailers. And they moved it, and the tank, they hit a bump, and it hit a, the tank hit. And it broke, fell off, and it created a spark. And of course, it started the tank when it broke, broke the valve off the bottom of the tank. And when Lawrence and I came up through the V pattern where the tank went, it went up the side of the building. You'd see where it burned the paint and everything right off. And of course, when it did, it melted the, the plastic on the windows. And it went into the third and fourth floors. And of course, it went right from one end of the building to the other. And I mean, Lauren, we didn't waste any time getting there, but it was going pretty good by the time we got there. And of course, back then, we didn't have a good hydrant system. And, we had to wait to get supply lines in, and we tried to knock it down with the first engine coming in, but it was we couldn't even have, didn't have enough water pressure to even get to the fourth floor, and we kind of waited for the for it, to, for it to burn down to where we could get at it. That was pretty much what happened. The fourth floor burned to the second floor, and then we could get on top of that and start putting it out. But pretty much ruined the whole south end of the building. Any questions? I gotta, I gotta get me a drink of water. How, how long did that take to? Like that? How, what's that? How long did it take for you know to uh, continue the fire? I don't think we had it under control. It probably took ten hours to get it under control. Well, we had like, we had we counted we had fifty four pieces of fire apparatus in town from everywhere and. Because we had, you know, we had no, we didn't have a water supply, so we had to get, you know, run tanker shuttles, and we ran hose lines from the Delwood Pond and Battenkill, and every thousand feet, you got to put another pumper in to boost the pressure up. So we had, from the Battenkill up Union Street, I think we had one, two, three, four, we had five pumpers in line. So there was six trucks there, and I think we had four from. Delwood, and then the rest were, you know, manpower. You know, a lot of trucks sat around, but I mean, we were getting tired, and, and I was young back then. <laughs> and we, I can remember that Mark Roberts and I were, our, we had a tower truck, we called it the tower truck, but it was a crane. And we got, Mark and I crawled up onto the, the boom of the crane, because we didn't have anything high enough, and Bennington had their tower out and back, and we were trying to get above the fire to shoot down in it. And Mark and I were up there, and I don't know how many hours we, sit, we, we were on there, but finally we got it out, and we had to have somebody else climb up the ladder or climb up the boom of the crane and chop the ice off us because we couldn't move. We were, Mark and I were, I was in the front, and he was behind me, and he had his arms around my legs, and we were just, we laid on top of that boom on that crane and just moving the, the, the whole two inch line back and forth. And Lawrence, you know, they yelled, we pretty much had it knocked down. And he says, you can get down. <laughs> we couldn't move. We probably had two and a half to three inches of ice on us. And we're yelling down a lot. We didn't have radio. You know, not everybody, the only radios, the three chiefs had portable radios. We're yelling down, we can't move. And they're like, what do you mean you can't move? Huh? We can't move. So somebody had to come up with a, a hatch, hatchet, and knock all the ice off our gear so we could finally get moving. But with all that ice on, you're pretty toasty warm. I mean, you, that's good insulation. And uh, 
that's we got, you know, you got all done and, and uh, we all went and took a shower and then we got called back, I don't know, probably four hours later because it flared up again. That's probably when you decided we need a tower truck in town? That was, you know, we kind of figured that after that. And that was, you know, and, the, you know, we were down to the old fire No, we weren't at the fire. Yes, we were at the old fire station. But that was when we kind of decided, because Bennington came up, if we'd had a tower truck Johnny on the spot, we probably could have knocked it down a lot quicker. But we didn't even have a ladder long enough to reach the fourth floor because it was 40 some odd feet in the longest ladder. It was 40, 42 feet to the first floor, fourth floor, and we, the longest ladder we had was 36. So it wasn't even a temp. And, and Lauren, we tried to get inside of the building, but it was just too dangerous to get, to try to get in and try to knock the fire, fire down interior without somebody getting hurt. It was very lucky that nobody did get hurt. You know, it's, it's, it was a pretty hot fire. Any other questions? Yes. Was that the original reconstruction of the equinox? Yes, that was. It was. Um, it lay dormant for quite a few years, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, I and remember. they had a big auction there. I guess was was the name Bennett? Didn't Ian Bennett buy it? And mm -hmm. and, uh, and he and then for the bank foreclosed on him, and then. The Galici Group, Galici. I think, was bought it, yeah. and and then they restored it, and, and I can remember Doug Shaw. We were all standing, we were all done. Bless Doug Shaw. He always had he always had one comment, and there was Lawrence and the Galici Group, and uh, the the manager, the general manager of the hotel, Tom Malhot, or was it Malhot? And Doug is standing there, and of course he had underneath his gear, he had his, his suit and tie on, which he always fought fires with his suit and tie on, with his turnout gear over the top of it. And he looked at this whole group, the Galici group, and he says, by God, I've been on this fire department for 25 years waiting for this to burn, now I can retire. <laughs> and I thought Lawrence was going to die. And, and, and Doug just turned around and walked away. <laughs> Yep, that was pretty funny. So, Grove, I see the sign out there by the firehouse about more volunteers. Or is it hard to get volunteers? Or? It's very hard. I mean, we, as, as uh, I'm an instructor, we, we started our Firefighter One program here in Manchester in September. And it's a 193 hour class. And that's to become. A firefighter one, which you know, from soup to nuts. It's hazmat operations awareness, interior firefighting, you know, moving hose lines, running pumps. It's everything. And like, and I've been teaching. You know, we, we there's a core of about five or six of us instructors have been teaching this class all winter long. And, and uh, Saturday we we finished up with a, one of the last practicals, which was moving hose lines, and you know hooking up the fire hydrants and teaching the students. We started the class in uh, September. We had 34 students. We're down to 20 right now. And it's because the, your, our insurance companies are making it so hard for, they won't insure us unless we are fully qualified to go in and, and fight a fire. And they keep throwing these uh, scenarios at us where, you know, it started out when I first got on, it was a 45 hour course. When I got done with a 45 hour course, I threw it, knew how to throw an air pack on, put on my PPE, my, my protective clothing, and move a hose line and go inside and, and put the wet stuff on the red stuff. And that was basically what, and, and you know, and, and there's a bunch of us, our, our average age in our department is 55 years old. And, you know, we had a call today. Uh, chicken coop was burning just before I came over here. And we had five, four of us show up, plus two chiefs. And that's in the middle of the day. And 
I was the oldest one in the firehouse, and the rest of the guys were in their, in their you know, 55. So there was four of us at the firehouse between 55 and 65. And all we had was four guys show up to the call in the middle of the day because everybody else is working. And then Chris and Jamie were on the scene. So it, it's, we, we've addressed this with the, the core of instructors, with the core of instructors that I teach with and I got into an argument with our chief of training at the academy. They come out with a new class that says, okay, we're gonna have an exterior firefighting class. Well, I looked at, at Chief Lynch and I said, Pete, I got a whole bunch of people that know how to fight outside fires really, really well right now because they're all 55, 60 years old. So why am I gonna go and teach young kids that wanna go inside and, inside and, and go inside and fight a fire they're not interested in being outside. They want to be inside, but they don't have <coughs> enough, uh, you know, enough time. They've got a family. They've got a job. They've got, you know, all, the, all going on in their lives, which is a lot more than there used to be. And, you know, in the country, it's so much more time consuming. I said, why can't we come up with a course like I took? And he says, it's the insurance companies. They want insurers. And it's, uh, it's a... And what they're trying, what we're talking about now is, is to, as me being an instructor in the Manchester Fire Department, is to say, okay, town of Manchester, if I train some young guys to get on and I put my stamp because I'm a certified instructor, can we, will the insurance company insure us for an interior and, and put on a class, a 50 hour class with uh, some younger kids. There's a lot of kids around here that want to join, but, you know, as I said, when I was growing up, I had a business, and boy, when I got done work, I wanted to go to the firehouse. Now, if you've got a family, you got soccer games, you got volleyball, you got hockey, you got all the, and the kids have got to go here, go there, go everywhere. And uh, it's not like when I was growing up. I mean, what we made our time out behind the house and had a, and had a football game or had a, uh, a soccer game or played baseball or whatever. That was the only outdoor activity we had. We made the activity ourselves. Today there is so much more activities going on and parents and the students want to go to all these activities and the parents don't have time enough to become firefighters. And I don't know where it's coming to. As, as I have said earlier and I've talked to John O'Keefe that they better plan on doing something down the road with the fire service and it's not just here it's all over the country where they've got to lighten up on some of the rules and regulations and go back to the old school and, and uh, where we can get younger younger firefighters in there and, and do the job. Well do you ever see it getting to the point where it becomes a paid fire department? <laughs> the only way it, you know and, and when I was chief John and I, and, and this, we discussed this. And of course, when we did the MRI, MRI study with Dorset and East Dorset, you know, in some of our meetings with MRI, the, the consulting group, we discussed that. But if you're going to do that, you've got to take the rescue squad and you've got to cross train rescue and fire because you've got to make it lucrative. You've got to, you've got to figure out how to pay your firefighters and your EMTs. And a lot of, you know, like you, the EMTs, Rescue Squad probably does 1,200 calls a year. We're doing two and a quarter, 200 runs, and a lot of them are false alarms. I mean, we haven't had a, in, right here in the town of Manchester, we've not had a fully, fully involved structure fire since Sherry's Cafe, and that was almost three years ago. And I don't know if it's because of our fire prevention or we do a good job or everybody's, you know, is Johnny on the spot. We've had a numerous, numerous, very close calls. We had one last week at the Silas Griffin Inn and so is it sit down in our down in south of town. All I can remember is where Ronnie Hess used to live next door to that. Um, the panel box caught on fire behind the Seth Warner Inn. And they could you know, we couldn't do anything with it until Green Mountain Power came and cut the power off because the fire was behind the the mirror box, and you, 
can't put water on electricity because it's not healthy for you. Mm -hmm. So he kind of had to wait for and that. That's the closest thing we've had to a major structure fire since Sherry's. I mean, we have, we do a lot of mutual aid because like Wind Hall has only got, you know, during a day, very few firefighters. Uh, South Londonderry has a really, really good department. They have a, probably 12 or 14 good interior firefighters. And I've taught every one of them that's taken the Firefighter 1 class here in Manchester. And most of them are Firefighter 1s and Firefighter 2s. And but as Chief Duda over the mountain, and we've been going over there, and they're coming down here. And East Dorset has a handful of really good firefighters. And Arlington has, you know, interior guys is what we need because I'm not throwing an air pack on anymore. I can tell you that right now. Not at 65 years old. Uh, they'll be carrying me out. And this is what it's coming to. We need young blood, young blood in the, in the fire service. And as if we don't, the town may have to go to a paid, paid department but you're going to have to cross train fire and rescue to try to make it lucrative how to pay for it. Any questions? Any other questions? Oh, yes. Can you talk a little bit about the fire of that grabbers, the restaurant burned down? I'd love to, but you know where I was? I was on vacation in the Dominican Republic. <laughs> And I got a phone call. I called back and they said, well, you should have been to the fire. And, but I can, I can tell you that they never found out what caused it. And, uh, but I was not here, so I can't touch base on that. I just know that it was a hell of a fire. There was some renovation going on there at the time. There was Something like that, yeah. But it basically, it got, the fire got underneath the floorboards. And I know that some of the guys I talked to when I got back, they were inside and you could hear the fire burning under their feet. Mm -hmm. And the floor was so hot that, it, you, you know, their boots were starting to melt. And they didn't realize where the fire was until they took their turnout, their Domex hood, and you could hear it rumbling under it. And that was when they decided maybe it would be a good idea to get out of there. And because it, you know, it was a, what we call is a building with balloon construction. And balloon construction buildings start from the cellar, and the walls were built from the cellar all the way to the top. And it's, the walls are called a chase. So if the fire starts in the cellar, it'll go from the cellar all the way to the peak of the roof. And that's what happened there. It got into the walls and the floors, and the floors are all, and today, you know, you, you build your deck and then you take the wall and you stand the wall up on top of it. So if the fire starts in the cellar, it can't run up what we call the chase. And you know, that's the, my first experience with a Bloom construction house was one in the village and it was Christmas Eve. And I had never dealt with a Bloom construction before. I'd heard of them. My house is that way. Yeah, and, and it, they were sitting in the living room and they had a wood stove in the kitchen, and they had newspapers, and the newspapers caught on fire, and there was burned a hole through the wall. Before they realized what had happened, the house filled up with smoke, the kitchen was fully involved, and it was, it's an old, old house in the village, four-story house, and they were, you know, on the other end of the house, the living room, and by the time they realized what was going on, and we got there, it was right around 12:15. And it was, the kitchen was fully involved, and so we, I sent a crew in, we tagged the hydrant, went in, and we knocked the fire down in the kitchen. But the fire was going up the whole side of the building outside. And we, and of course, it had gone to each, each floor. It was, there was three, it was a three-story house, old, old house in the village, and we spent hours and we'd cut holes in the wall, and we'd stick a hose in there and try to put the fire out, and each, each petition would be on fire through the whole wall. And, then we're, and I'm standing outside, and I'm watching. Now i got flames coming out of the peak of the roof. So I called everybody out, and I says, we're, and I, says I want everybody to just stand back. And I went up into the attic, me and another guy with an airplane, and just stood there and listened. 
and you could hear the fire. So we came back down and we sent two crews up into the, into the attic in the law, way up with two chainsaws and cut the ceiling out and put the hose lines down the outside of the, from the, from the peak of the house, down the walls. And you could see where the fire had burned throughout the outside walls and the water was running out through the holes. And that was at 4 o'clock in the morning, and that was when I first realized how I guess we put out a balloon construction house fire. And it only took me about three, well, it took all of us about four hours to figure out how to put one out. And if we have another one like that, that's probably where we would start. Was that house destroyed? It was destroyed. I mean, we, we saved the inside of it, but and we tarped a lot of them, you know, because it was an old colonial house in the village, and the furniture was, we, we covered everything with tarps, and they salvaged a lot of stuff in there, but it had to be torn down because what it was not structurally sound. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Can you talk a, a little about when the reluctant came I sure can. That was another good one. I'll start with where I was at the time of the fire. A friend of ours, we built a camp up on the mountain up here. It's just above Whitsand. And my forte is Eggs Benedict. So we were at camp, and I was making the holiday sauce on the stove. And I heard my, my pager went off and said, we have a dryer fire at the Reluctant Panther. And I says, oh, we've had those before. Somebody's, I won't mention, something caught on fire in the dryer. So I didn't pay any attention. And Dave Hosley and Kevin Casey and Beaver Capusta and we they're all standing there and looking out the window. And I'm stirring the hollandaise sauce. And Dave turns around and he says, boy, it doesn't look like a dryer fire to me. I says, why? What do you mean? There's a lot of black smoke coming up down there. And I looked down and I said, holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then the tone goes out again and says it's fully involved. Well, I had my Jeep and I went flying down out of camp went to my house, jumped from that into my truck, and got up there. By the time I got there, again, that was a balloon construction house or building. But they had added on. They'd covered this up, covered that up. And the fire started in the worst place that it could, which was in the cellar where the dryer was. The dryers were in the cellar. And, of course, once it got into the, into the walls, it went up through, and we were, again, I was in an interior attack crew trying to save the north end, which we cut the fire off there. And we had crews, and we were inside that building all around trying. Finally, we just, you know, we couldn't stop it. it was, the fire was just running rampant everywhere. And so we called Lawrence Grant, and uh, he brought his excavator up. And he reached up and knocked one wall down, and there was a fake door in a closet and he reached up and took the door off the closet and the inside of the closet, and there was no way to that closet because they covered the door up. I mean, and that was, and we finally just put the water to it and tore the building down. But that was started from the dryer in the cellar. And that went back and forth. To, I don't know how many times I got subpoenaed into court because the dryer company was blaming it on the electrical company and it went back and forth and and I sat I had to do two depositions on that and f I don't know whatever happened but the dryer the insurance company wanted the dryer company to pay for it and the dryer company was was saying somebody else said it and it went round and round for years I don't know whatever happened about it but Oh yeah, it was very new. It was very new. They had just he had just opened. I think he only been here two weeks. Yep. It was the first day of deer season, wasn't it? It was move-in weekend. It was the weekend before. Because we always move our gear into camp the weekend before, and so that's what we were doing. We've had a number of good fires the first day, first weekend of deer season. I mean, Bennington tire burned and. The first deer season, I was at we were, I was at your camp that weekend, Crunch, when Bennington Tire caught on fire. And that was in Bennington. We sent a crew to that, and then there was a 
barn fire where we had this Leary kid that kept on setting things on fire in town and he burned a barn on East Manchester Road the first night of deer season and then we had the old movie theater in the village caught on fire the first night of deer season and so what do you think about the bowling alley they should tear it down yeah why why well, he, he finally has the, the permits. When I, when I was the chief, we, he came and there was... Price Chopper wants to build a new, you know, store there. But the grocery stores can't have bends in them. I don't know if you knew that. I didn't know that either. They can't have bends in them. Grocery stores have to, can't have a bend because they're shelving. So it has to be a straight building. So... They have to tear where Price Chopper is and tear where the, from Price Chopper all the way back, and it would go straight back. So they had to cut back into the bank. And they wanted to put a 40,000 square foot, add 40 more thousand square feet for a store. And they had all the permits, but we had to do something with the bank behind there, which is all clay, and it keeps riding down. And to do how far back if what we call a collapse zone in the back of a building, if the building is, say, uh, <clears throat> 24 feet high, it's times two the distance the way you want your truck. So it's got to be 48 feet away, and there's not enough room enough back there. So this is back when Ellis Spieth was alive, and him and I sat down and came up with the engineer. He was the engineer, and I said, well, you know, the World Trade Center and the the uh, Empire State Building caught on fire, but didn't fall down. The World Trade Center did, but why can't we construct a building, a wall back there, where you can guarantee that it's not going to collapse? And that, you know, these are some of the things as fire chief that you sit down and I don't want, I wanted to see a new price chopper come in here, but I didn't want to see it squashed because we had, you know, he was going to have to put a $400,000 retaining wall in to move it back. So he came up with a, with a, an engineer designed the whole back of the new price chopper down there with a collapse, the, the back walls on it cannot collapse. The whole build structure can burn to the ground and those walls are gonna stand straight up. So now we're not afraid to put a fire truck back there with a crew if we have to go inside. So that, so it went straight back and, it, and it's supposed to go back and then and it went back to the bowling alley and the bowling alley, they were gonna reuse that but now because we had a fire there about a month ago where the kids got inside of it and had a bonfire inside of it. And we got there just in time to put it out and the kids took off and they blasted holes in the side of it and they boarded it up. And now the, between the fire department and the zoning commission with Janet, they're trying to get the owners to tear it down and they're, he's waiting because he wants to break ground in spring. So hopefully we'll, we'll get a new price chopper and the, the permits are all in place, but they want the fire department, Chris, the new chief, we all want that building torn down. And it's a shame, it's a gorgeous building, but it's gonna be in the way of the new price chopper because it's, you know, that's supposedly what's happening to that. What's the reasoning that they have to be straight? Because you're shelving inside the building, you know, like you can't, you can't put a bend in a, in a, in a cooler. And, then, and I didn't know this until, you know, the owner of the, the guy that was doing the price shop, he said, he, if you do, it's got to be a straight square, you know, square building. It can't have bends in it because you can't put shelving or coolers or anything on an angle. So, Davey. As tempting as uh, Crunch and I would like to probably tell a few cowboy stories about you, I won't. <laughs> But what I would want to talk to you is about eight years ago, I got to host a fire. And I watched you guys come in there at 5 o'clock in the morning on a bitter cold night. And how expertly you took care of all of that. And all the things you took care of that subsequent to that. In addition to just all the things that you did for us. It was way and above what you would expect to do. I just want to thank you for that. I just thank you. To see you guys at your best. In addition to that, I think you came to me about that building, which was about half consumed, half burned, 
you said we make a good exercise and do some fire exercises. And you set that up there and did because there was an apartment that you fixed up, the people were in there, you could have all those people go through that and how well that was orchestrated. That was a very good training exercise for Yeah, us. but I, what I was impressed with was what you pulled together. You had that so well organized, I don't know, you must have had a dozen of them lined up in teams of four or something. And they would go through and they found all those dummies. Then you all got to have fun when you torched it off. But oh, yeah. I, I just want to just thank you for that. I mean, because I got to see you guys at your absolute best. Thank you. Well, that's the fun part when you get to set them and put them out. Yeah. It's, uh, you don't. It, I guess, as I said to Scott when he was bringing in a bunch of pallets, he came after, went after it with a blowtorch. I said, I guess that's an accelerant. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't take long. No, no. I mean, and, and I can remember when. When Lawrence was chief over on Essex Circle, I don't know a lot of you where the new highway went in. We had a, it was it was fun. I mean, we had four apartments. Essex Circle, it was at the base of the mountain where the new highway came in. And there was a bunch of houses the state bought. And back then, of course, we didn't have environmental control officers. We didn't have, and all you had to do was just take a piece of paper and sign it and say we're going to do this for fire training and send it to the state of Vermont and if they didn't reply in 14 days we got to burn it and so Lawrence we had him filling these things out and send them out like it was like every month we were burning a house and and we got really good at, at, at training because you just didn't you you don't get to burn a house and go in and, and do training we had everybody from East or Arlington we had every department coming, and, and it was really, really good training because we'd go in and set the set a fire in a room. We'd go up and put it out, and then we'd come back out, and sometimes somebody wouldn't get it out, and then the next time it went out, it would, you know, a whole room, the place was fully involved. So then we'd have to put it out and then go to the next, and we had, there was one that had four condiment or four uh, apartment houses. We kept on burning out. Finally, we lost it, and the whole thing burned to the ground. And that was what our tensions were, because they want us to burn them to the ground anyways. But, but though that training, and today it is, it's a, a nightmare to, because of your environmentalists and you got, you know, we didn't realize you had asbestos in them, you had shingles. We didn't know that. It was 30 years ago, 35 years ago, 30 years ago. Yeah, for you to exactly that, because for you to do that was exactly that. We had to take the shingles off it. We had to take a bunch of stuff out yeah. there. There was a whole, you had a really Yeah, and this was only 10 years ago. Yeah, now, yeah. like I said, and, but you had yeah, the shingles, many things that you had to environmentally comply to before you could even before think we can, about and this, and this is after it already burned. Yeah, that's right. It already, it's already two-thirds of it half burned, yeah. And they, that was back about 10 years ago is when they, you know, they changed. And I can see why. I mean, you know, because we used to just, you know, I don't, everybody's seen a fire somewhere. It's the black smoke rolling out. That's not good stuff to be breathing. That's why we wear air packs. And, you know, and, and, and like from the beginning of, of when my dad was chief, you know, you saw the, the pictures of, of the Garrow's, Garrow's fire. You know, they didn't have any fire turnout gear. They might have had a helmet and, and nothing else. And because back then a fire, the hottest an interior fire would burn would be maybe six, eight hundred degrees. Today, in this room alone, these are all synthetics, and, and uh, they'll burn up to 1,200 degrees. I've been inside training uh, in, in down in New York City where just pallets, and it's called a, a training simulator. It's a, they call them hot boxes in FDNY. And we, there's benches on both sides, and they start a fire up on top with pallets. And there's one instructor in one end of this in, in hot box and one on the other, and they open it up, and the wind goes across. And I was, th I was in there with a camera, and it was on the top of Jim Doherty's helmet was 800 degrees with a camera. And I was up in front, and what we were doing is we were shut. The closer you get to the fire, um, the hotter it got. I mean, you were sitting next to you had an instructor here, instructor here. And we, we were pretty safe. I mean, it was pretty cool, but it was, it was really hot. And so we would switch. And so I went down, and I got on the floor 
because there's what we call in the fire service the fire devil. And if you see the fire devil, he's usually coming to get you. And this would, and every time they would open up one of the vents on the, the hot box, the fire devil would f go across the top of the ceiling. And it looks just like a devil, an orange and black devil going across the ceiling. And then he'd shut it down and the devil would go away. And I had the camera, and it was 1,800 degrees in the ceiling. And then they would open it up, and you would see the fire devil, and then he'd go, and he'd go out the vent. And it was about, and we did turns of laying on the floor and handing the camera. Now, it's, I would say we probably are a little bit crazy, but it was the coolest thing that I've ever, and, and to do it in training, where you can watch the fire devil. And I have been in fires where we've seen flashovers and been in very close calls. And those are places you don't want to be. Training exercises, when training um, at the academy, we just have a brand new burn building that we just installed, which we're going up to do that in April. And I haven't been in that yet, but I don't go in them anymore because I'm too old. But this is a nice brand new facility that we've just, they just built this summer. And that is a lot, but the old, old building was a concrete and buckma with, and we have fire panels in it. And it's, and it's pretty neat. I mean, if you ever get an opportunity to go to the academy and see the things that, that is, we've built up there. And the academy, I, everybody here must know Ted Hopkins. Ted, Teddy was instrumental. He was one of our, he's one of our past chiefs. And, doing the academy and it started out with him and Buster Reed started the academy up there and started all this and back in the mid 80s because we couldn't get federal funding because it was owned by the Vermont State Firefighters Association which was not affiliated with the state we couldn't get federal funding for training and that was when I started to become an instructor so I was I was just certified with all the other instructors we were pretty much just instructors we had no certification. One instructor said, yeah, you're certified to teach that, and okay. And so we went on about it. But then we, uh, the Vermont State Firefighters Association, which back then we had like 7,000 members of, of, in, the, in the Vermont Firefighters Association. And we gave the academy to the state of Vermont for a dollar. And then, and I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing, because now we have the, you know, Bureaucrat, bureaucrats involved, but it has gotten better. We've all, us in the Corps of Instructors are all now nationally certified fire instructors. We can go, I can go anywhere in the country and teach Firefighter 1. Our Firefighter 1 programs and Firefighter 2 programs are all nationally certified by the Pro Board, what we call the Pro Board. And any of our firefighters like Zach Dilworth, who's Mom and Dad live here in Barnaville. I had him in Firefighter 1, Firefighter 2, and he now is a paid firefighter in, um, down in Connecticut. And he comes up here when he does a 24-hour hitch down there, and then he comes up here for 48 hours, and he's on our fire department for those 48 hours. Then he goes back down to Connecticut, and he does his, his tour of duty down there. And But they, when his... They called me and asked me, what, what about Zach? I says, I really don't want to let him go, but he's, he will be an asset with your department. And they snatched him right up instantly because they didn't have to train him. They, he, was, he walked in the door, and he was, he was already trained. And this is one of the nice things about going from the VSFA to the Vermont Fire Academy all of our students that we like the the core of students that we have right now that that we're te we've been teaching all winter they have they will take a written test they will go through their practical exercises when they get done if they pass the 100 question quiz with a 70 or better they will all become firefighter one certi certified and they can go anywhere in the country and get a job if they want to do it which is uh dan zimmer which is a He's retired now, and a bunch of us are, you know, are getting older. But he was instrumental in pushing, and now we're kind of, 
we've pushed and pushed and pushed, and now I think some of it has come back to bite us in the butt because we've pushed, we've got so many firefighter ones and firefighter twos out there that, and now we're begging for just firefighters. And we've pushed the training part on them, and now it, we've trained, I think, about everybody that we can train, but the younger people that are coming up just don't have the time. I'm rambling on. Any questions? Yeah, uh, just curious. Back in the day, as they say, the, uh, the siren uh, is what alerted the firemen that there was a fire or whatever. Uh, today, with technology and whatnot, I'm sure you all have toners and whatnot. But we still hear the siren ring. Does it serve a purpose or what? Well, it's like, um, I don't know if it does anymore. It does for me because, like, I don't have my pager on right now, but now our, our tones go through, the, through our phones, mm -hmm. and we do have our pagers. But if I'm outside mowing the lawn or I'm outside doing garden, I'm not going to wear my pager. And I like to hear the siren blow every day at noon. Mm -hmm. um, and plus, if we have an emergency or we have a hurricane or we have a national disaster, that's one thing that the sirens, like the sirens down in the south, that's, you know, when they have hurricanes, they blow that siren continuously. And that's one of the main reasons that we have it. If we do have another Irene or we have something that we have and, and we lose our communications, which during Irene, we had, nobody had any cell coverage because the power was out to all the cell towers. And the, pretty much the only, the only communication we had was with portable radios. And we didn't have any cell, cell coverage anywhere. Or landline. That was about it. But while I was out in the field going and looking at damage, the only way I could get back to dispatch was was with my portable radio. And you know, and, and the other, we and we have had where the radio systems have gone down, but we can still blow the siren, and it's it's like a backup. What's that? Well, it used to be when. You know, like one fire, one if they blew it once, it was only, you know, like a brush fire. If it blew it twice, it was like a chimney fire. If you blew it three times, it was major. And then if they kept on blowing, it was a major disaster. I mean, that was 50 years ago. Now, it, now what our protocol is is with dispatch is to put the tone out three times, no matter what. So you put the tone and blow the siren out once. Uh, announce what you have for call and its location, and you do that three times. And then after that, a chief will sign on, and then, and then if the chief, you know, like if we get to the scene and we need more help or that the firehouse, we don't have enough, then we'll continue to put, put more tones out. And after five minutes of putting tones out, if we don't have enough people show up, we will go to mutual aid. And, and that has happened. I mean, we had to call a couple, three, three winters ago. Everybody was out plowing snow. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. We had a CO call. I'm in my bucket loader. I got, par I got snow two feet deep. I couldn't go. And finally, they called me and I said, well, call East Dorset. We had one guy that could get to the firehouse. The rest of everybody else was snowed in. And so we had East Dorset come down and take care of a fire call at Torrey Knoll. And that was because either, either we couldn't, nobody could get out of their house or everybody was out plowing snow. It was one of those I don't know, three, four winters ago when we had all that snow. But that's one, and, and the sirens is that it doesn't blow it from 11 to 6 either because it bothers the neighbors, picks everybody up. So we did stop that. Even with the fire or something? If it's a major fire, we'll blow it. Any other questions? I don't know if I can talk anymore. <laughs> You're welcome.